Hello and thank you for joining us for today's video. In today's video, we'll be discussing three unsolved mysteries involving video clues. The first case is about the mysterious disappearance of a 30-year-old Mormon man. Did he choose to disappear? Did he die by suicide? Or did something more sinister happen? The second case we'll cover is about a woman who was murdered in her Houston apartment. The police have CCTV footage of the killer, but he's never been identified. The police think that the murderer might be a hitman or a serial killer. But at this point, both the police and the victim's family are desperate for answers. Finally, our third case is our most requested case of all time. Honestly, we didn't cover it sooner because we thought that the case would be solved relatively quickly. But it's been four years since the double homicide and no one has been arrested in connection with the murders. The police and the victim's families are hoping they are close to solving the case. Do the police currently have the killer in custody? Or is the killer still out there? But before we get into our first case, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, NordPass. When I think about how many usernames and passwords I need for all my online accounts, I get a headache. It seems like every site has their own set of rules for usernames and passwords. The last thing I want to do is write them down because that is insecure. But I've started using NordPass and I love it. NordPass stores all my usernames and passwords and with just one click, all that information is filled in for me. Not only does NordPass save my usernames and passwords, but it also saves my financial information. This makes shopping online not only a breeze, but also incredibly safe. I've used a competitor's product, but I like NordPass so much more. I find NordPass easier to use and there's no glitches. Plus, when it comes to things like passwords for every account I have and all my financial information, I want a company I can trust protecting that data. And I can do that with NordPass because it's powered by NordVPN cybersecurity professionals. NordPass has a great deal for criminally listed viewers. Just go to nordpass.com slash criminally and use the code criminally to get 70% off a two-year NordPass premium plan, plus you'll get a free month. Keep your passwords safe and get organized and help support criminally listing the process by checking out nordpass.com slash criminally. Number 3. Stephen Kosher Stephen Kosher was one of Rolf and Deanne Kosher's five children and they lived in Amarillo, Texas. The Koshers were devout Mormons. Stephen first attended Ricks College, which is now Brigham Young University, Idaho, before transferring to the University of Utah. He graduated with a degree in communications. Ultimately, he wanted to be a journalist. As is common with Mormons, he did missionary work. For his missionary work, he went to Brazil, where he learned to speak Portuguese. In December 2009, 30-year-old Stephen Kosher was living in St. George, Utah. He had worked for the online division of the Salt Lake Tribune, but he quit and relocated to St. George in April 2009. Near the end of 2009, Stephen was having financial trouble because he was having problems finding a job since it was the Great Recession. He had a part-time job handing out flyers for a window washing company. Stephen had a roommate, but the two weren't friends and they didn't have much in common. On the night of December 12, 2009, or the morning of December 13th, Stephen left his home and drove off in his white 2003 Chevrolet Cavalier. On the morning of December 13th, two friends called him on his cell phone. They were wondering if he could cover their Bible study groups. Stephen told them he was in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is about 120 miles from St. George, but he could return to St. George and cover for them if they really needed him. They told him not to worry about it and they would make other arrangements. 
Steven didn't explain why he was in Las Vegas, and neither of his friends asked him why he was there. That was the last time any friends or family talked to 30-year-old Steven Kosher. Four days later, on December 17th, parking enforcement in Henderson, Nevada, called Steven's parents. Downtown Henderson is about 16 miles from downtown Las Vegas. Steven's car had been found abandoned in an upscale retirement neighborhood. It had been there for four days. Rolf and Deanne called Steven's cell phone, but his phone was dead. The service provider was unable to locate the phone. Steven's parents called the police in St. George and reported him missing. His parents went to his home and they found his laptop and his phone charger still plugged into the wall. Rolf went to pick up Steven's car. He noticed that there was nothing wrong with it and the gas tank was half full. So the car had not been abandoned because he had car problems. But this only made Rolf worry more, so he called the Henderson police. Inside the car, they found blankets and pillows. They also found a Kmart bag that had some Christmas gifts in it that had been purchased just days before. The Kosher family talked to people who lived in the neighborhood where Stephen's car was abandoned. They learned that one house on a corner had two security cameras. They were able to review the footage and they saw someone driving Steven's car down the road at 11.54 a.m. on December 13th. Six minutes later, at noon, a man is seen walking down the road with something under his left arm. He then turns and walks down another street and out of the view of the camera. Because of the quality of the video, no one is sure what is under the man's arm. Also, no one, not even Steven's mother, can say with 100% certainty that the man was Steven. But his family, who has reviewed the video countless times, believes it is him, but they cannot say for sure. Steven's family noted that he didn't seem disoriented, confused, or lost. He seemed to be walking somewhere with purpose. But the police and Steven's family have no idea where that somewhere might be. His friends and family do not think he knew anyone in Henderson. About five hours after the man was recorded on the cameras, Stephen's cell phone signal was picked up in a residential area about nine and a half miles north of where his car was abandoned. Two hours later, his cell phone pinged in a neighborhood about two miles north of where his cell phone last pinged. The following day, at 6.04 a.m., someone used Stephen's cell phone to check his voicemail. The phone was used near Interstate 95, about two miles north of where it last pinged. Then it appeared that the phone stayed in that area for two days. That was the last trace of 30-year-old Stephen Kosher. His cell phone has never been found. More importantly, Stephen Kosher has never been located. There are several theories about what happened to Stephen Kosher but all the theories have significant flaws. The first theory is that Stephen chose to disappear and he started a new life somewhere. 
But Stephen didn't have any money, which would have made it difficult for him to choose to vanish. He also loved his family, and he had no problems with them. There was some speculation that Stephen ran off with a 28-year-old woman named Susan Powell. Susan went missing from West Valley City, Utah, five days before Stephen went missing. Susan's husband, Josh Powell, suggested that Susan and Stephen ran away to Brazil, where Stephen did his missionary work. But there is no evidence that Stephen Kosher and Susan Powell knew each other, let alone ran off together. It's also doubtful that Stephen left the country. Stephen's passport was found among his possessions in his home. Also, Stephen hasn't used his bank accounts or social security numbers since he disappeared. Josh Powell is considered the prime suspect in the disappearance of his wife. We cover the complex and tragic case of Susan Powell in our November 2017 video, Three Murder Cases with Bizarre Twists. A link to that video is in the description box, and we'll also have a link at the end of this video. Another possibility regarding the disappearance of Stephen Kosher was that he was high or drunk and he was killed in some type of accident. After all, someone dying from partying too much or misadventure in Las Vegas isn't exactly unheard of. But Stephen was a devout Mormon and he didn't even drink coffee. Plus, if it was him seen walking away from his car, there were no indications that he was intoxicated. Another theory was that Stephen was involved in some type of illegal activity, like running drugs. An officer with a K-9 unit examined Stephen's car. The officer was confident that no drugs had ever been in the car. Yet another theory is that Stephen died by suicide. After all, he was having financial trouble and he was having problems finding meaningful work. But his family did not think he was suicidal. They pointed out that he had purchased Christmas gifts for his family. He also told his parents they planned on coming over for Christmas on December 23rd. So there was a sense that he was looking forward to the future. Also, if Stephen did take his own life, where is his body? A massive four-day search of Henderson and the area around it was conducted. But no trace of Stephen was found. If someone is murdered, the killer, and possibly their accomplices, can hide the body. A suicide victim can't exactly hide their body after they die. Finally, there's the theory that Stephen met with foul play. The problem is, is that there is absolutely no evidence to prove this. Stephen didn't have any known enemies. Also, if the murder were personal, he most likely would have been killed closer to his home. No one knew he was planning on traveling to Nevada, so it seems unlikely that he was killed for personal reasons. One possibility is that Stephen was lured to Henderson and then murdered. But again, there is no evidence to back up that theory. Stephen's computer and email account was searched and nothing was found to explain why he traveled to Nevada. Since Stephen has never been found dead or alive, the possibility that he met with foul play has not been ruled out. Unfortunately, there are more questions than answers regarding the disappearance of Stephen Kosher. A significant question is why did he travel to Nevada? His computer and email accounts were searched and his family found no reason why he would have traveled there. Nor did they find evidence that Stephen visited websites dedicated to suicide or sites that give instructions on disappearing and starting a new life. Nothing of interest was found on his laptop. His family believes they plan to return home after a short time away. Otherwise, he probably would have taken his laptop with him. Stephen Kosher's family holds out hope that he is still alive and he will be found soon. 
If Stephen Kosher is still alive at the time of this video, he is 41 years old. Number 2. Shelby Thornburg Shelby Thornburg had a childhood that no one would envy. She was born in the mid-1990s in rural Texas. She came from a broken home and she and her older sister, Christina, bounced around between foster homes. Sadly, they both suffered terrible abuse and neglect. When Shelby was in her teens, she suffered from depression and obesity. At one point, she weighed over 300 pounds. Amazingly, Shelby managed to lose over 180 pounds. With her weight loss came a heightened sense of self-esteem. At some point, Shelby moved to Houston, Texas and got a boyfriend. Eventually, they moved into an apartment together. Shelby decided that she wanted to be a model. But she felt she needed a tummy tuck to remove excess skin from her stomach area after her weight loss. Shelby was looking to make a lot of money quickly, so she started doing escort work. Her family and her boyfriend knew she was doing sex work. Her family tried to discourage her from doing it, but she wouldn't listen. On November 4th, 2015, at about 8 p.m., Shelby's aunt sent her a text message and asked her if she had time to talk. Shelby said she couldn't talk because she was working. That was the last time her aunt talked to her. At 8.06, Shelby received a text message that said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. Shelby replied, okay. At 8.33 p.m., she received a text message from the same number that said, Hey, I'm here. Seven minutes later, Shelby sent a text message to her boyfriend that simply said, Good. This was a code word Shelby used to tell her boyfriend that everything was fine after meeting with a client. This was the last time anyone heard from 20-year-old Shelby Thornburg. Her boyfriend tried to contact her several times over the next couple hours, but she didn't respond. He went home and he found a bloody crime scene in one of the bedrooms. Shelby was face down on the blood-soaked bed. He called 911. The medical examiner determined that Shelby's throat had been slit with one powerful cut from behind. The cut was so deep it nearly reached her spine. Her throat was cut from left to right, suggesting that the killer was right-handed. There were also defensive wounds on Shelby's hands and shoulders, so it appears that she put up a fight before she was killed. Shelby's sister, Christina, thought that Shelby's boyfriend was the killer. But the police were able to rule him out as a suspect because he had an airtight alibi. The police did not find any fingerprints from the killer, but they did find a little bit of DNA evidence. They submitted the DNA profile to the FBI's combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS, but it did not turn up a match. The police think that some of the best evidence is CCTV footage of the lobby of Shelby's apartment building. A minute after the text came in at 8.33 that said, Hey, I'm here. A young man is seen walking through the lobby to the elevator. At 8.57, the same man is seen walking calmly through the lobby and out the building. He is wearing sunglasses and his right hand is in his pocket. The police firmly believe that this is the man who murdered Shelby Thornburg. The police do not think that the man had been a client of Shelby's before, but they are sure that he went there with the intention of killing her because there appeared to be some planning that went into the murder. The police said that one possibility is that the murderer was a contract killer. 
They noted he nearly managed to decapitate Shelby with one cut, and he didn't get any blood on him. He also walked calmly through the lobby after murdering the young woman. They think he kept his right hand in his pocket because he possibly injured it during the murder. These are not the actions of an everyday person who murders someone. The police tracked the killer's phone and learned it was a pay-as-you-go phone that could have been purchased anywhere without providing any identification. What they did learn from tracking his phone is that he had tried to meet other women who were similar to Shelby. Specifically, he was looking for a petite, blonde sex worker. So the police think that the man is more likely a serial killer or a budding serial killer than a hitman. If he is a serial killer or a man who wants to become one, the police want to catch him before he kills again. Shelby Thornburg's family wants answers and justice for her brutal and senseless murder. Number 1. Liberty German and Abigail Williams Delphi is a small city in Indiana. In February 2017, it had a population of only 2,800 people. On February 13, 2017, best friends, 14-year-old Liberty German, who went by the nickname Libby, and 13-year-old Abigail Williams, who went by Abby, were dropped off near a trail in the historic district of Delphi. The two 8th graders were planning on going on a hike on a trail. At 2.07 p.m., Libby posted this picture of Abby on Snapchat. They are walking on the Monin High Bridge, which is an abandoned train bridge that crosses Deer Creek. The two girls were supposed to meet Libby's father at 3.15 p.m. Sadly, neither Libby nor Abby showed up at the arranged meeting area. The girls' family searched for them, but by 5.30 p.m., they had not found any trace of them. So they called the police. The police initially thought that the girls had simply gone lost. But then, around noon the next day, about half a mile away from the bridge, they found the dead bodies of 14-year-old Libby German and 13-year-old Abby Williams. The police have never released the cause of death other than saying that the girls had been murdered. The day after the bodies were found, the police released a photo of a man. They did not call him a suspect, but they did say that he was walking in the area at the same time the girls went missing. They also did not say where the photo came from. Then five days later, the police clarified that the man is a suspect. On February 22nd, the police release a new piece of information. Is the following audio recording. In case it wasn't clear, it's a man saying, down the hill. The police revealed that the audio and the photograph of the man came from Libby's smartphone, which was found with their bodies. Sadly, despite the clues, no arrests were made in the months after the murders. Five months later, in July 2017, the police released a sketch of the suspect. The sketch was developed based on witness accounts of people who were in the area. The man was described as 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 10. He weighed 180 to 220 pounds and he has reddish brown hair. Tips poured in after the sketch was made public, but once again, no arrests were made. Two months later, the police announced that they had a person of interest. A registered sex offender from Indiana named Daniel Nations was arrested in Colorado after he threatened people walking on a nature trail in a wooded area with a hatchet. Just before he was arrested for threatening people, a 61-year-old cyclist named Tim Watkins was shot to death in the same wooded area. 
People have speculated that nations killed walk-ins. Investigators in Delphi noted that nations looked a lot like the man depicted in the sketch. They also learned that nations was living in Indiana at the time of Libby and Abby's murders. The police investigate nations and he denied killing anyone. Nations was ultimately cleared as a suspect in the murders of Libby and Abby in February 2018. He has never been charged in connection with the murder of Tim Watkins. Watkins' murder remains unsolved. In April 2019, the police released some information regarding the investigation into Libby and Abby's murders. This includes a new sketch of the suspect which shows a man who is younger than the man in the original sketch. The investigator said that the new sketch is a more accurate depiction of the suspect. The investigator said that they think that the killer is between the ages of 18 and 40 and he may appear younger than his actual age. They believe that he lives or works in Delphi or at the very least is very familiar with the area. The police also released new audio and a video taken from Libby's phone. The new audio only has one more word and the video is only a second long. Here's both the audio and the video. We'll play them both several times. The police are hoping that someone will recognize the way the man walks. However, they know he was walking on a train bridge, so it may not be the way he usually walks since he is trying to step on boards. Despite the slew of new information, no arrests were made. But the police kept finding new persons of interest. On June 23, 2019, 55-year-old Paul Eder supposedly kidnapped a 26-year-old woman after she got a flat tire near his home in Tibbecanoe County, Indiana. Tibbecanoe County is the county that neighbors Carroll County, where Delphi is located. Edder allegedly raped the woman at his farmhouse and then released her. She went to the police. Six days later, on June 29, 2019, the police attempted to pull Edder over as he was driving. This led to a five-hour standoff. The standoff ended with Edder shooting himself dead. Even before the standoff, Edder was on the police's radar regarding the murders of Abby and Libby. That was because someone had called the tip line and suggested him as a suspect. After Edder's death, the police said they got a sample of his DNA and they are going to continue to investigate to see if he was responsible for the murders of Abby and Libby. When the two years since that happened, the police have not said if he is still a suspect or if he has been cleared. The latest suspect emerged just days before we started production on this video. Downtown Lafayette, Indiana is only about 17 miles from Delphi. On the evening of April 19, 2021, a nine-year-old girl was reported missing in Lafayette. The police searched her neighborhood and they encountered 42-year-old James Brian Chadwell. They asked Chadwell if he had seen the girl and he said that he did. She had been at his home earlier but left. The police officers continued to search for the girl and they decided to return to Chadwell's home. They asked for permission to look inside his house, and he agreed. They discovered that the basement had a chain lock on it. The police managed to get into the basement, and they found the missing girl. She was alive, but she was nude and in bad shape. She was taken to the hospital, and Chadwell was arrested. The girl explained that Chadwell had lured her into his home with the offer to pet his dogs. Once she was inside, he attacked her. He struck her on the head several times and strangled her to the point of unconsciousness. 
he took her into the basement and sexually assaulted her. Shadwell was charged with a slew of crimes, including attempted murder and kidnapping where the victim is less than 14 years of age. The police have said that Chadwell is considered a person of interest and the police are actively investigating him. Amateur sleuths have noted that a tattoo on Chadwell's arm resembles Libby German. But it's not known if the tattoo is based on Libby or when Chadwell got the tattoo. So at this point, the police do not even consider the tattoo to be circumstantial evidence, let alone proof that he was involved in the murder of the two girls. At the time of this recording, the police are actively investigating James Chadwell as a suspect. But as of right now, he has not been charged in connection with the murders of Libby and Abby. The police said that the investigation into the murders of the two girls has never gone cold and they will continue to investigate the murders until the killer or killers are brought to justice. There is currently a reward of $325,000 for information leading to an arrest. A park in memory of Libby and Abby is being constructed in Delphi and it is expected to open in 2021. We hope that the next time we do a video about updates on cases, we'll have news regarding charges being filed against the person or people who killed Libby German and Abby Williams. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our sponsor, NordPass. NordPass is an amazingly easy and safe way to store all your usernames, passwords, and financial information online. They have a special deal for criminally listed viewers. Just click on the link below this video. Also, please don't forget to check out our podcast, Into the Killing. In our latest episode, we look at the case of a mother who was stabbed to death while her 12 year old daughter listened. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, Amazon Music, and Apple Podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.